This morning, I have the privilege to share God's Word, and we're going to be taking a look at Genesis chapter 27. But before we do that, we're going to have a rather long introduction to bring us to that place so that we can appreciate what we are reading. It's a rather long chapter, so rather than having me read it right from the start, uh, I'm going to read it in the middle of the message today. Uh, Last week, Pastor Caleb introduced us to Isaac and Rebecca's family. Do you remember? And the challenges that came when they had twin boys, twin sons born to them. And what you have basically is two parents with two children and not exactly what you would call a model family. I don't know how else to say it. The parents show clear favoritism and do a number of things which are disturbing. But this really illustrates dysfunctional family in awe that the word of God is very honest, very transparent. Nothing is hidden. Even in the lives of patriarchs, there's things that frankly are very sad. Because I think that what we're going to read today is a sad account of a dysfunctional family. One of my favorite professors, uh, Dr. Douglas Stewart, who taught Old Testament at Gordon-Conwell, he used to say that when you look at the Old Testament scriptures, there's really only one hero, and that is God himself. Anybody that has any detail written about them, ends up looking pretty bad. Now, that can be discouraging, but it can also be encouraging because God knows what we offer him to work with. And yet, he can use each and every one of us despite our many imperfections and and the ways that we struggle. So, God had revealed to both parents that there were twins in Rebecca's womb, and then he revealed something unusual, if you remember, that the older will serve the younger, and that was unusual, very unusual. It went against social custom, but God himself had made it clear. He had prophesied what was coming, and it goes to show, we're reminded again, that God calls the shots. And he is not limited by the usual social custom. We see that here. We see that many other places. Yet even with this prophecy, this awareness, Isaac chooses to favor the firstborn, Esau. And Rebekah clearly chooses to favor Jacob. Last week, we saw how Esau despised his birthright by selling it to his younger brother Jacob. And for what? For a single meal. It goes to show, it it reflects his misguided priorities. And Esau, throughout the scriptures, especially in the New Testament, is seen as, you could say, a symbol of unholiness or ungodliness. That for a single meal, he would sell his birthright. Now, there's a difference between the birthright and the blessing. And this is part two. In part one, Esau despised his birthright and sold it outright. In part two, Jacob will steal the blessing. And the blessing is different than the birthright. Just by way of review, the birthright, usually by custom, goes to the older of the children. And they get a double portion. So if there's just two sons in this case, 
then Esau really was, should have gotten two-thirds of the inheritance once Isaac died. Jacob would get one-third. But Jacob found a way to sort of manipulate the situation, and Esau fell prey to it, and he gave up his birthright. But the birthright was more than that because it was also the position in the family. Once the father is gone, the one with the birthright is the leader of the family. And that is a big deal in a hierarchical society. The family head is very, very important to the welfare of the family, and there's great responsibility with it. Now, my hope is not only will we kind of learn from some negative examples of what's here, but also that we will see a very valuable tool in parenting known in Jewish circles as the blessing, something that most of us Gentiles are not that familiar with, but we ought to be familiar with it because it's biblical and it's important and it's, it's a very key tool in the proper raising of our children. So listen carefully as we read about these two sons of Isaac who intensely desire their father's blessing. I've entitled the message this morning, Bless Me, My Father. But before we look at Genesis 27, I want us to consider the power of a father's influence through his words. Proverbs 1.8 says, Listen, my son, to your father's instruction, and do not forsake your mother's teaching. We parents are primarily responsible for transferring our faith, our values, our worldview to our children. We pastors can help, and we want to help. But ultimately, our children will look to their moms and dads, and especially to their fathers. Whether we realize it or not, we dads are primarily responsible to teach our children things like how to respect and submit to proper authority, how to fear God or reverence Him, how to work hard, how to manage our property and our wealth, how to have right relationships with other people. These things are caught by modeling, and they're taught with our words. And it really is up to us to transfer our basic value system of what's right, what's wrong, what's true, and what's false. And that is all the more important because we're living in a time of great deception when we're hearing all kinds of lies through the media, through the society, through cultural elites that are telling us new truths, which aren't truths most of the time. And sometimes they're blatant lies. So it's a challenging time for young people growing up to navigate this. What do they believe? What do they know is true? And of course, actions always speak louder than words, so I want to qualify that. But the real question to ask is, what are we modeling with our children? What are we modeling? As important as our actions are, and it is true, like if, if, if we don't walk the talk, then our children aren't going to really care what we say. So we, our actions have to back up our words. But our words are very important. Our instruction is very important. So, words do matter. And dads are there to, to train and to offer correction to their sons and daughters. Proverbs 23, 13 through 14. Do not withhold discipline from a child. If you punish them with the rod, they will not die. Punish them with the rod and save their soul from death. 
Proverbs 22, 6, train up a child in the way they should go, and when they are old, they will not depart from it. I preached on Father's Day at Haven Reformed in Hamilton, a fellow alliance uh, congregation, and we looked at the very passage that we're going to look at in Genesis 27. So important what we communicate to our children and how we do it. We need to teach our children to respect proper authority, which in the home is parents. In the schools would be principals and teachers. In our society would be our government officials and our police. In the church would be the pastors. We need to be able to model submission to authority, and we need to be able to teach having a proper relationship with authority. And honoring one's parents is foundational for wise living. Paul says, as he writes to the Ephesians in Ephesians 6, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise that it may go well with you, and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. Fathers, do not exasperate or frustrate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Now, having said all of that, children need to hear specific approval from their parents, and especially their dads. Proverbs 18.21 says, Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. And James warns us about the dangers of our tongues. According to James, they can be like a destructive fire. James 3.10 warns us, out of the same mouth come both praise and cursing. My brothers, this should not be. Friends, we need to learn to praise and encourage our children and avoid cursing them. So now I want us to go to the passage. And this is one time when I won't have you stand in honor of God's word because it's a very long passage. But please do, if you have your Bibles, look. If not, they'll be up on the screen. When Isaac was old and his eyes were so weak that he could no longer see, he called for Esau, his older son, and said to him, My son, here I am, Esau answered. Isaac said, I am now an old man and don't know the day of my death. Now then, get your equipment, your quiver and bow, and go out to the open country to hunt some wild game for me. Prepare me the kind of tasty food I like and bring it to me to eat so that I may give you my blessing before I die. Now again, a blessing is important because it is imagining the future and the destiny for your children. It's prophesying and speaking out what you believe God has for them. Now Rebekah was listening as Isaac spoke to his son Esau. When Esau left for the open country to hunt game and bring it back, Rebekah said to her son Jacob, Look, I overheard your father say to your brother Esau, Bring me some game and prepare me some tasty food to eat, so that I may give you my blessing in the presence of Yahweh the Lord before I die. Now, my son, listen carefully and do what I tell you. Go out to the flock and bring me two choice young goats, so I can prepare some tasty food for your father just the way he likes it. Then take it to your father to eat so that he may give you his blessing before he dies. So interesting, isn't it? It's like, again, I want to just cut in here and say this is almost a case study in how not to relate to your children. And 
before anybody gets any wrong impressions, I don't want to encourage anybody, any young person to deceive their fathers. It's not a good thing. And for that matter, to take advantage of the weakness of your your brother. Jacob said to to Rebekah, his mother, but my brother Esau is a hairy man while I have smooth skin. What if my father touches me? I would appear to be tricking him and would bring down a curse on myself instead of a blessing. Now notice here that Jacob is concerned not with deceiving his father. He's concerned about getting caught. He's concerned about the consequences that his father might become enraged and bring a curse on him instead of a blessing. Rebekah, his mother, said to him, My son, let the curse fall on me. Just do what I say. Go and get them for me. So Jacob went and got them and brought them to his mother, and she prepared some tasty food just the way his father liked it. Then Rebekah took the best clothes of Esau, her older son, which she had in the house, and put them on her younger son, Jacob. She also covered his hands and the smooth part of his neck with the goat skins. Then she handed to her son, Jacob, the tasty food and the bread she had made. Jacob went to his father and said, My father, yes, my son, he answered. Who is it? Now, if you're Jacob, this is a true moment. Jacob said to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. I have done as you told me. Please sit up and eat some of my game so that you may give me your blessing. Now, right away, what do you notice about all of this? How important is a blessing? To Jacob, it is worth risking even a curse coming down on his head to get that blessing. It is so valuable. He's willing to risk it. Isaac said to his son, How did you find it so quickly, my son? I love the answer. The Lord, Yahweh, your God, gave me success, he replied. Very spiritual answer. (laughs) The Lord enabled me to do it, my father. Then Isaac said to Jacob, Come near so I can touch you, my son, to know whether you really are my son Esau or not. Now it's getting suspenseful. (laughs) If you're Jacob, you think, oh boy, here it goes. Here's the test. Jacob went close to his father Isaac who touched him and said, the voice is the voice of Jacob, but the hands are the hands of Esau. He did not recognize him, for his hands were hairy like those of his brother Esau. So he proceeded to bless him. Are you really my son Esau, he asked. I am, he replied. Now, I don't know if you're counting, but he's just lied three times to his father. This is not what to do, young people, okay? But it's happening. Then he said, My son, bring me some of your game to eat so that I may give you my blessing. Jacob brought it to him and he ate. And he brought some wine and drank. Then his father Esau said to him, Come here, my son, and kiss me. So he went to him and kissed him. When Isaac caught the smell of his clothes, he blessed him and said, Ah, The smell of my son is like the smell of a field 
that Yahweh the Lord has blessed. Now, that may not sound like much of a blessing to you, but you've got to remember he's a shepherd. He spends a lot of time in the field, and he loves nature. So to smell Esau, to, it smells like the fields. Yes, it's wonderful. May God give you heaven's dew and earth's richness, an abundance of grain and new wine. May nations serve you and peoples bow down to you. Be Lord over your brothers, and may the sons of your mother bow down to you. May those who curse you be cursed, and those who bless you be blessed. Notice that there's three elements with this blessing. First, there's material wealth. May God give you the best so that you can accumulate plenty. Then secondly, the position. May nations serve you and peoples bow down to you. May the sons of your mother bow down to you. And then the third part is that covenant formula. May those who curse you be cursed. May God curse the ones who curse you. And whoever blesses you, may they be blessed. The same blessing, the same covenant blessing and curses as we see in Genesis 12 with Abraham, with God's covenant with Abraham. That is so much of a part of covenant. May though, whoever blesses you will be blessed. Whoever curses you will be blessed, will be cursed. In other words, God has your back. After Isaac finished blessing him, and Jacob had scarcely left his father's presence, his brother Esau came in from hunting. He too prepared some tasty food and brought it to his father. And then he said to him, My father, please sit up and eat some of my game so that you may give me your blessing. His father Isaac asked him, Who are you? I am your son, he answered, your firstborn, Esau. Isaac trembled violently and said, Who is it then that hunted game and brought it to me? I ate it just before you came, and I blessed him. And indeed, he will be blessed. When Esau heard his father's words, he burst out with a loud and bitter cry and said to his father, Bless me, me too, my father. And he said, Your brother came deceitfully and took your blessing. Esau said, Isn't he rightly named Jacob? Now, if you're named Jacob, let me just explain that. I mean, Jacob means he grasps. It means supplanter, someone who is a little bit deceitful. Don't be bothered if your name is Jacob. My name is James, and James is the English version of Jacobus. I have the same name. But by the grace of God, my name has been redeemed, and I'm not a supplanter. <laughs> But that's what it means. He grasps the heel. He deceives. He tricks. He's living out his name, basically, is what his brother Esau is saying. And then you see it's so sad. Isn't he rightly named Jacob? This is the second time he's taking advantage of me. He took my birthright... And now he's taking my blessing. Then he asked, haven't you reserved any blessing for me? This is where the story really gets sad. Because who said that all of the blessing should go to one of the sons? That there wasn't enough blessing to go around for the whole family? Isaac Answer Esau, I have made him Lord over you, 
and have made all his relatives his servants. And I've sustained him with grain and new wine. So what can I possibly do for you, my son? Esau said to his father, Do you have only one blessing, my father? It's a really good question. Do you have only one blessing? Bless me too, my father. Then Esau wept aloud. His father Isaac answered him, Your dwelling will be away from the earth's richness, away from the dew of heaven above. You will live by the sword, and you will serve your brother. When you grow restless, you will throw off his yoke from off your neck. Now, I don't know about you, but that sounds like more of a curse than a blessing. And we see the results. Verse 41, Esau held a grudge against Jacob because of the blessing his father had given him. He said to himself, the days of mourning for my father are near. Then I will kill my brother Jacob. When Rebekah was told what her older son Esau had said, she sent for her younger son Jacob and said to him, your brother Esau is planning to avenge himself by killing you. Now then, my son, do what I say. Flee at once to my brother Laban in Haran. Stay with him for a while until your brother's fury subsides. When your brother is no longer angry with you and forgets what you did to him, I'll send word for you to come back from there. Why should I lose both of you in one day? Both meaning both her husband, Isaac, and her son, Jacob. Then Rebekah said to Isaac, I'm disgusted with living because of these Hittite women. If, and, and you have to understand, Esau had chosen to marry two Canaanite women, two Hittites. And it says they were a source of great grief to Isaac and to Rebekah both. This is a dysfunctional family. I mean, imagine Isaac had the benefit of Abraham had, had sent a servant all the way to his own relatives in order, to keep the, in order to keep a spiritual purity, and Rebecca was the result. So he marries Rebecca, and, and now their firstborn Esau turns around and, and marries not one Canaanite woman, but two. And they are a source of great grief to the parents. So Rebecca says to Isaac, I'm disgusted with living because of these Hittite women. If Jacob takes a wife from among the women of this land, from Hittite women like these, my life will not be worth living. So then Isaac called for Jacob and blessed him. Then he commanded him, do not marry a Canaanite woman. Go at once to Padan Aram, to the house of your mother's father, Beth Bethuel. In other words, go to your uncle. Take a wife for yourself from there, from among the daughters of Laban, your mother's brother, Uncle Laban. May God Almighty bless you and make you fruitful and increase your numbers until you become a community of peoples. May he give you and your descendants the blessing given to Abraham so that you may take possession of the land where you now reside as a foreigner, the land God gave to Abraham. Then Isaac sent Jacob on his way, and he went to Padam Aram, to Laban, son of Bethuel, the Aramean, the brother of Rebekah, who is the mother of Jacob and Esau. That's pretty much the entire account, with the exception of one detail. And that is, only then did Esau realize that the women he had married were disgusting to his parents? And I'm thinking, where's the communication? Where's the passing on of worldview? Where's the values? Isaac, Rebecca, what's going on here? That Esau doesn't even know how you feel 
about the spiritual pollution having married two Canaanite women. It's really sad. There's so much here. I want to just bring out some important things to realize, and that is blessing is so important that our Heavenly Father, God himself, told Aaron, the high priest, and the priest that they should bless the people of Israel. So when a service ends, bless them with these words. The Lord said to Moses, tell Aaron and his sons, remember they're the priests, this is how you are to bless the Israelites. Say to them, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and grant you his peace. You find that in number 6, 22 through 26. Often a benediction. It's a wonderful benediction. That and this whole ancient Jewish practice known as the blessing. You know, no matter what age we are, we need the approval from our fathers. And it's especially true as the time of death comes near. And we catch a glimpse of this here and why it's so important. Consider the value of a father's blessing. Dad's blessing communicates acceptance and approval. That's what we have here. Isaac giving a rich blessing to Jacob. Now notice too, once the blessing is given, it's irrevocable. It's done. Even though Isaac realizes that it was done deceitfully, the blessing has been given and the blessing will stand. I blessed him, Jacob, and indeed he will be blessed. Fathers, we can't take back our words. Once we've communicated to our sons and our daughters, can't really take them back. We can ask forgiveness if we've said some things we need to be forgiven for, and we should. But we really can't ever completely take back our words. And our words can hurt. It's very interesting, isn't it? Bill Glass has an amazing prison ministry. And for years, he goes into the prisons. And he often brings speakers in with him. And one of the speakers is Beth's sister, Tanya. Tanya has gone into a lot of prisons with Bill Glass. And she notes that Tanya is the one that spins the basketballs on her fingers and does a lot of tricks and gets the attention and then shares the gospel. It's beautiful. But Bill Glass notices that he, he'll ask the prisoners. There might be 250 or 300 prisoners in an assembly, and he'll say, how many of you received your father's blessing?" And he looks, no hands go up. How many of you were told by your fathers that you were no good and you'd probably end up in prison someday? And 95% of the hands go up. It impacts our children. Once given, it's irrevocable. Jacob is willing to risk it. He's willing to risk a curse in order to get that blessing. Esau is seeking it with tears. What about me, my father? Don't you have anything left over for me? How about me? Can you give me something? Give me crumbs? Is there no blessing for me? Sought with tears tears. There are elements involved in blessing our children. It's kind of like, how many of you like gardening? Hmm. Yes. 
We're glad you do, Pastor John, because we benefit from that. He, he, he has all kinds of vegetables. We're only allowed in our condo to have flowers. But when you garden, the plants don't thrive unless they have good soil. What else? Yeah, I heard air, water, sunlight, and a secure place. So the, the roots can go down. In the same way, our children need about five elements, at least five elements. There's five elements here that dads can provide their children in communicating blessing. First is meaningful touch. We read, Then Jacob's father Isaac said to him, Come here, my son, and kiss me. Meaningful touch. Now, I don't know about you, but I came out of a home where my dad was not into, my dad was not into touch. We were not a touchy-feely family. I mean, I remember going to the mission field for the first time in my life, and I had been gone eight or nine weeks to, to India, and I come back, and I'm all excited to see my family, and my dad reaches out his hand. And I hugged him, and it's like very uncomfortable. Then I hugged my older brother, and we're close, so he tolerated it. And I hugged my younger brother, Mark, and he said, come on, Jim, people will think we're gay. But I learned, when I went to seminary, my roommate had a huggy, touchy family. And I would go there on the weekends because I was in Massachusetts going to school in the Boston area and didn't get home that much. And so I would go home for the weekend, get a nice meal. And they always greeted me with hugs. And I kind of learned to like it. And I decided, you know, something very meaningful is communicated by hugging. So I always, Beth and I always made sure we're going to hug our children. And when we see them, we greet them with a hug. Meaningful touch is very important. There was a study at UCLA done, that, and it said that if, if we are not touched eight to ten times a day, we won't thrive. Isn't that interesting? And now I think about all of the social distancing and all of the lockdowns. It's not healthy for us. The second thing, you know, I, I just want to say this. I actually know a missionary. We know a missionary that actually built a ministry by, in Albania. Susanna Dabney would go to orphanages five times a week and just hug babies and pick up those kids. They looked forward to it every day. It was like a surrogate mother. If, we don't, if they don't receive touch, they don't thrive. They'll actually die. Second element is a spoken message of blessing. Just like Isaac gave such a blessing verbally, children need affirmation. For us, it can be very simple. Communicate, I love you, my son. I love you, my daughter. Don't think your kids know that. They don't. They need to be reminded all the time. Silence is an enemy in the home. Counselors will tell you they don't know, so tell them. Tell them so often that they can't possibly miss it. Thirdly, attaching high value to the one being blessed. We read in Genesis 27, 27, so Jacob went to his father Isaac and kissed him. When, when Isaac caught the smell of his clothes, he blessed him and said, Ah, the smell of my son's like the smell of a field that the Lord is blessed. And goes on with the blessing. Attaching high value to the one being blessed. Fourthly, picturing a special future for them. We need to do that with our children. My best friend in high school happened to be Jewish. And I learned a lot by going to 
worship services with him, bar mitzvahs with him. I, it, it was fascinating because what I noticed is, is that when I'm around the Jewish parents, they brag about their kids. They boast all the time. Oh, my son's the smartest at this, and my son's the best at that, and oh, this is little Reuben, and he's going to be a lawyer. And this is Benjamin, he's going to be a doctor. They always picture something very fruitful. It's the Jewish blessing coming out. In contrast, I've seen other parents who, without even realizing it, curse their kids. Ah, he'll just end up, he'll end up good for nothing. He's just one of those useless teenagers. We've got to watch our words. Rather than, you know, I'd say avoid the cursing, (laughs) pour out the blessing. Pour it out. And whatever we do, don't say he'll probably end up in jail someday. Don't say it, even if you think it. (laughs) The fifth one is an active commitment to fulfilling what we believe the Lord has for them. If you think that your children are going to be, a, they have potential to be excellent musician, then make sure they get lessons. Invest in your children. But the biggest thing is invest time in your children's lives. The best thing you can give them is time and attention. There's a story by Charles Francis Adams, he's the U.S. ambassador to Great Britain during the time of the Civil War when Abraham Lincoln was president. He was a very important man at a very critical time in history. He didn't have a lot of time to give to his rather large family, but he did what he could. And in his diary, Adams' diary, he wrote, went fishing with my son today, it was a day wasted. That's too bad, because his eight-year-old son, Brooks, put something in his diary. This is what he wrote. Went fishing with my dad. It was the most glorious day of my life. It's all perspective. Never underestimate how those little things can make a difference in the lives of your sons and daughters. I want to close with this thought. Some of you uh, have been very blessed by great fathers. But some of you have been very hurt by your fathers. And that's just the way it is. Two things. I know that my dad loved me. But he had a hard time expressing it. And he knew nothing about a blessing. The truth is, he didn't know how to give a blessing because he never received a blessing. He had a terrible relationship with his own dad. Didn't enjoy him at all. My, his, my grandpa, was, I, I'm told, was, one, was a very strict and stern man. And he always... Tr- had trouble with my rather mischievous father. And then he died when my dad was 12, and he didn't miss him. And then he felt guilty about it. I remember sitting around on Sunday uh, afternoon meal, come back from church and and I, maybe it was me, maybe it was my brother. We'd ask him what grandpa was like. And my grandma would jump in there and say, there's a hall named the church, Harrison Hall, you know, very proud. He was, he was an elder. He was a deacon. He was very prominent in the church. But my dad would say, well, he wasn't a very good father. I know because he never did anything for me. And then he would tell a story about getting a used bike for his birthday, but his sister got a brand new one. Stuff like that. I remember hearing that. 
And so, back in 2013, I'm a missionary in Bahrain, and I'm preaching a Father's Day message, and I use this passage about the importance of blessing your children. And I sort of make a confession that at the end, I've never received a blessing from my father, but I was determined because he was dying of cancer, going through chemo, that when I went home on home ministry, I'm going to ask him for a blessing. And I thought, I'm going to have to explain what I mean because he doesn't know what it is. I, the, the good news is, praise God, he gave his blessing. And then I went back three months later and officiated at his funeral. I say this because if, if you've been hurt from your father, I want you to know that we serve a, a God who is our heavenly father. And when we come into a relationship with Jesus, we then have our heavenly father's blessing. And we can get a direct blessing from our heavenly father. And we can break that cycle of not being blessed or not feeling blessed. We need to receive blessing in order to be a blessing to others. We need to receive the blessing in order to pass it on to our own children so they know whose they are and that they're valued. Amen? And I just want to say this too. For those of us who have been hurt by our fathers, this is where some of us can step up to be like fathers to the fatherless. Something we can be. I'm, I'm so excited about the idea of mentors. And now, you know, to, to assign a mentor to a, to a young person as they're preparing to, for profession of faith, such a great idea. And that's what we're beginning to do. Some of us need to step up and offer ourselves as mentors to those that maybe don't feel the blessing from their fathers. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you and we give you praise that you give us what we need. You bless us so that we can receive your sacrificial love, your grace. We can enter into a relationship with the living God and know the blessing of God. And then we can pass on our blessing to our own children. Lord, help us to do that, to bless our children and never to curse them through our words. And Lord, help us. Give us wisdom from your word about what it means to experience your love and your grace and to communicate blessing on. Thank you, Father, for this passage. Thank you, Lord, that you're able to redeem any situation. And even though the means were bad, yet you used the blessing that Jacob was given to work your plan of salvation. The line of redemption would go through Jacob. Thank you, Lord. You're the hero. And we thank you that we belong to you in Jesus' name. Amen.